stand beside you. Thank you. Good morning, bon matin à toutes et à tous. Um, le projet de loi C-233, loi modifiant le code criminel et la loi sur les juges, euh, vont, euh, violence contre un partenaire intime, également connu sous le nom de loi de Kira, en la mémoire de Kira Kagan, alors âgée de 4 ans. La troisième et dernière lecture du projet de loi a eu lieu hier au Sénat. Le projet de loi est parrainé par l'honorable Pierre d'Alphonse Sénat et appuyé par les députés Pam de Moff et Yara Fox à la Chambre des communes. Je leur suis éternellement reconnaissante pour leur immense travail et implication durant tout le processus. Cette initiative législative importante a pour but de mieux protéger une victime de violence conjugale et ses enfants suite à une séparation notamment dans les cas où le contrôle coercitif a été exercé. Les études montrent que la séparation du couple ne brise pas systémiquement le cycle de violence. Bien au contraire, les partenaires violents en viennent souvent à la violence pour reprendre leur contrôle coercitif. These actions can include harassment, threats, assault, and even murder. These acts may be so subtle that the aggressor in many cases succeeds in portraying themselves as the victims. The actual vulnerable party ends up being perceived as the one with mental problems or as vindictive. This results in the real victim being re-victimized. I am grateful and pleased to see the immense support that the passage of this law received from members of parliament, as well as the Senate and organizations individuals and stakeholders across Canada. The message is clear. We all agree that more needs to be done to protect women and their children who are also victims of domestic violence. Bill C-233, which passed yesterday at the Senate, is a concrete step in the right direction. Thank you. I think Jennifer, I'm going to yeah, work with Brother Tim. You want to just say that so she can. Jennifer? Yeah. Jennifer. Hello. Good morning. Thank you to honorable members of parliament, MP Dillon, MP DeMoff, and MP Sachs. Thank you for bringing forward this important bill, which represents a part of Kira's legacy and is a wonderful, you know, shows her as a wonderful symbol of protection for victims of violence and children. We are most pleased to see this bill uh, pass and receive unanimous support in the House of Commons and in the Senate. This bill signals a change in the way domestic violence will be treated by the family and criminal court system. Time's up in terms of victims of domestic violence not receiving the protection that they need, in terms of children being put into unsafe hands, into the hands of an abuser, like what happened to our daughter Kira. We need to see a change in the way that judges understand domestic violence and coercive control. And this bill brings about that change. So I wanna thank you and Senator Delfon and all honorable members who have uh, contributed to this uh, piece of legislation. Um, it was an honor to participate in this process. Although, um, you know, we have gone through immeasurable tragedy and we want to spare other children and families from this horrific outcome that we have experienced. And I'll just add to that, that it is, of course, um, a really emotional time for, for Jennifer and I, uh, just because of the nature of, of how it came to be that, uh, that this bill was passed and why it was uh, so, so necessary. Um, but we wanted to thank you as well for, for allowing Kira's legacy to live on in, in, in the law and throughout all of Canada. The fact that it was unanimously passed has shown that the country of Canada as a whole treats these issues and thinks of these issues as a very serious and needing an urgent attention. And we hope that Kira's legacy will be one of protection for victims and, and other children so that other parents don't have to go through what we went through today. But on a more positive note, the fact that it was passed in, in such a short order uh, based on how things usually go um, really shows the dedication um, 
that our country has uh, to bringing these issues to the forefront. And hopefully we do get that culture shift. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Bon matin. Um, there's a, an expression from Sanhedrin that says, to save one life is as, to, as if to save a world. And today, with the passing of C2, or last night, with the passing of C233, we're beginning the process of restoring worlds, protecting worlds, protecting children, mothers, and families. C233 and its formation, which includes the option to contemplate electronic monitoring for abusers while they are going through the process of being evaluated by the court system, and the compilation of that with education for judges on course of control creates a comprehensive toolbox of understanding the pathology and the tragedy that comes from intimate partner violence and coercive control and how at the critical moment when a woman or family member chooses to seek protection for themselves and their children is the most dangerous moment. That is why balancing the two aspects of this bill, both electronic monitoring and the training on course of control and its, and its dangers is so important. We want to make sure that CARE's legacy is one that will protect more children in the future. And I want to thank my colleagues, Pam DeMoth. I want to thank MP Andrew DeLon, who created space for the communities across this country, for women and children and the stakeholder organizations to come together to make this shift, to make this change, because it has mattered to so many mothers, to so many families, to so many children, to so many advocates for the protection of families in the system. Um, there is more work to do. We know that, but we know that collectively we have started the conversation that will not stop. Thank you to all who have been here today, and I pass it on to my colleague, Pam Zamoff. Well, what a great day today. Honest to goodness, this is um, this is terrific. And, and it's because of so many incredible people who heard about Kira Kagan and knew that wanted to help her change the world. I've, I've heard it said many times, and I believe it, that Kira is an angel. Um, but she needed a guiding light to make this happen. And that's her mom, Jennifer, and her, her, her stepdad, Philip. Jennifer Kagan reached out to me on Twitter in a direct message. She's not my constituent, but I absolutely love her and told me about Kira and what had happened in the court system and said, we need to change this. So here we are today. Last night, we were joined by survivors, women's organizations. It's, it's been so incredibly encouraging to see people rally around Kira's law and I just, I've got a, a little bit of a list of people who helped that I do want to recognize. Our Justice Minister, David Lametti, and his team that I know worked on, on this. Um, it had all party support. Karen Vecchio, Leah Gazan, and Adrienne Laroche, um, who worked incredibly well, all of us, to get it out of the house. Um, my staff, uh, Sarah Thomas and Connor Lewis, who was working on it before because our staff are unsung heroes, and it would not have happened without them. And of course, Anjou and Yara and Senator Delphon. Um, we are an incredible team who got this through the House and the Senate last night. Um, but I think most importantly, Kira Kagan. Kira was going to change the world. And we're here today because she has changed the world. And she is starting conversations, not only with our bill federally, but across the country in provinces. I know my colleague, Effie Triantophilopoulos, the uh, provincial member, moved a motion in the provincial province of Ontario legislature. So Kira has started a movement that I know will, and I got very emotional, we all did last night, uh, when Kira's name was in, said in the Senate. And I was thinking that 100 years from now, when we're all gone, Kira Kagan will be in the House of Commons records, in the Senate records, in such a positive way that she was able to save lives. So thank you to everybody who participated in this. And if there are any questions, we're happy to take them. Uh, first, 
just had a question for Jennifer. I'm quite familiar with uh, Kira's story, but I wanted to ask you just what today means for you um, after so long for advocating for these kind of measures. Could you just identify yourself for Jennifer? I'm Marina from CBC News. Today, just the culmination of you know th this process and represents just an incredible achievement as to what this means for children down the line for victims of violence. Um, it's really, it's really incredible. Um, and it means a lot to us that we, you know, that this has been successful and that Kira, we've now solidified Kira's legacy in Canada as a beacon of protection and safety for others. And, you know, as Pam Dimoff said, Kira wanted to change the world. And in this way, you know, through this bill, she will, I, I believe in the ripple effect, and this is going to save, you know, many, many lives um, and, you know, is the start of many conversations that are going to take place in, in Canada. I had a question for Philip as well. I, you're a family lawyer yourself. Uh, this law will only look at federal judges. What are you hoping kind of comes from this? And are you thinking that it's going to be thorough enough um, to kind of make a difference in the whole system? So, Actually, it's already making a difference throughout the whole system. Uh, as uh, MP Demoff has said, uh, one of her counterparts on the provincial level uh, has already uh, passed what they called Kira's Law motion to bring this law to the provincial level and also expand it to other provincial players, such as Children's Aid Society workers and so on and so forth, uh, police officers, crown attorneys. Um, obviously, that's still in the works and that's going to take uh, uh, time because uh, it needs to be thoughtfully planned and, and dealt with. Um, but it, but you know what I usually find is when the federal government uh, certainly sends a message throughout Canada uh, that they want something done, which they've now done, the provinces take note, and we note that it, it it appears that it's already having that effect that Jennifer's saying, uh, like a ripple effect in some regards throughout the provinces, starting with Ontario, and I believe others will follow suit. And Philip, why, why is this law necessary? Because you're all familiar with it, you've all been working on it, but for people who are hearing about it for the first time, and Jennifer, feel free to weigh in, but why is this law something that is important to have passed? I mean, I'll just say that a woman is killed every other day somewhere in Canada. 30 to 40 children are killed by a parent every year. So innocent people are being killed and even one is too many. So that's my short answer of why this is important. Um, like women and, and kids are losing their lives at the hands of violence and it's not being taken seriously. You know, children and, and women are not being protected and they're being failed by the legal and you know, child protection system. So, so what, we, we, need, we need to bring about change to, to save uh, those lives. And, and even if murder is the most extreme example, we have uh, people who are suffering abuse at the hands of violent partner, children who are experiencing domestic violence, which leads to a myriad of lifelong physical and mental health consequences. So uh, those kids matter, Kira matters, and we're here for, for the voiceless. And what I'll add to that is I think we need to recognize that the judges are human beings, uh, people just like everyone else. And just because they became a judge, it doesn't mean they're magically bestowed with, with all knowledge of life. And some judges uh, possess uh, training in domestic violence and some judges don't. But what, what I found in, in practice is um, there was a lack of education that was being provided to judges about issues of domestic violence and especially issues of coercive control, which is a relatively new concept uh, that's making the public discourse, but is equally, if not more important to understand than domestic violence. And so um, it's important that we get that education out there for judges, because what we found is a lot of times we're still using really outdated stereotypes on what domestic violence looks like in the current modern society. It's no longer bumps and bruises. Um, we need to know more about it. And it's important because they're our final gatekeeper. Jennifer, I, I wanted to ask you, um, your personal experience was with judges. Um, you don't need to get too, too much into it, but can you just tell me about some of the difficulties you encountered with the justice system and why you felt that this law was so needed to change and in your personal story? So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when we went to trial in my matter, I was before a judge with a background in labor and employment law, and he cut me off on the stand when I was talking about domestic violence and parenting and the effect on our daughter. And he said, domestic violence is not relevant to parenting. Pathological lying is not relevant to parenting, and I'm going to ignore it. 
He then, you know, essentially fashioned a shared parenting schedule for our daughter, placing her into unsafe hands. Um, this is just one example. Um, you know, I encountered uh, judges who were not informed or educated on domestic violence and course of control and did not understand that when a woman is at risk, so is the child. Jennifer, how are you feeling today knowing that uh, Kira's legacy is now in this law? I mean, it's exciting. I'm, I'm really grateful to, you know, everyone we're seeing on the screen. We've been working with these mem wonderful members of parliament for, you know, close to three years now with most wonderful senators. And I'm really appreciative of, of everyone's efforts. And I'm feeling, um, you know, I'm feeling excited about what this is going to mean in Canada for, for other survivors. And the hope that this is representing within the domestic violence community is, is monumental. This is a historic bill. You know, domestic violence has lived in the shadows historically, and we're bringing it out into the public discourse, and that's extremely important. You want people to know about Kira? Oh, I want Kira to know that, you know, she wanted to change the world. She was so fierce and spunky, and she would have done great things. So, you know, we're, we're going to do them for her. <laughs> and she, and would, she, would, she would be, uh, you know, just overjoyed and, and you know, to, to know that her legacy was was going to help others. You know, Kira had a motto, ninjas never quit. I mean, even in the face of insurmountable obstacle, you, you keep going, you, you keep battling. And, you know, that's what we've done. And that's what Kira would want us to do. We're, we're not going away. And, you know, this is not going to be the end of the changes. The changes that class. On, on, in terms of I do have a question online. So Jason, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. I don't know if you can hear me. I just want to make sure that I'm being heard. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, Jennifer Pelop, uh, um Going back, um, how are you reflecting on achieving your mission, getting to this point? We're, we're incredibly excited to have gotten to this point. This is a historic piece of legislation and it heralds change for survivors and children in the family and criminal court system and you know represents immense hope within the domestic violence community there's a lot of um, women and children who are very fearful uh, and living with you know immense harm and this bill is giving them hope that things are going to get better uh, for them and for their children and i'll just say as, as i reflect as well it takes people to care. And, you know, when we uh, met these wonderful MPs and senators who, who really cared, um, they helped uh, get this passed, obviously. And uh, without their help, um, this would have been just another tragedy that, that would have gone by the wayside. And, um, you know, we were originally told, uh, not, by, not by these MPs, but you know, you're not getting any laws passed, you know, that's never happening. And, um, but, but, you know, with the diligence and the hard work that everyone uh, uh, did, um, we, we achieved the goal. Follow up. Hi, sorry about that. Uh, my next question, uh, I, I'm not sure who's able to answer this, but what, what kind of, um, where are the gaps I mean, if we're going to uh, specifically when it comes to either uh, judges or other judicial workers, where are the gaps that are being missed right now when it comes to uh, a, a lack of, um, uh, of um, an assessment when it comes to uh, domestic violence cases? Where, where, where are judges and other workers, uh, uh, are, well, what are they missing and what is the framework um, going to be when it comes to this, uh, this expanded education? Um, what are they going to need to know moving forward? So I guess I'll I'll try to I'll try to answer that as the uh, resident family law lawyer here. Um, that's a really tricky question to answer because there are there there are uh, gaps in the system and, and and systemic failures that are ongoing, but they are being recognized because this bill deals with uh, federally appointed judges. Um, the provincial uh, level are dealing with provincially appointed judges and hopefully others in the system. Um, but, you know, really, I think the best way of answering this is anyone who has any semblance of touching a file that involves violence, domestic violence especially, 
and dealing with children needs to have the training because when we're dealing with first responders, police officers, when we're dealing with child protection workers and assessments are being done uh, that aren't really being done properly because they don't have the training, they don't know how to recognize risk factors for homicide or risk factors for ongoing domestic violence. We need to have everyone sort of educated, but where this bill really comes into play is it sends the ultimate message, which is, look, federally appointed judges, which are the ultimate, which are the ultimate gatekeepers here, um, please make sure you're educated in this area. And as I kind of said, from federal to provincial, it's almost the same from judges top down. Um, everyone, please get educated on this as well. And so this is the start, but not the end. Or do you have any more questions, Jason? Um, I was just wondering, uh, I, Jennifer, you mentioned that a labor law, uh, labor judge was uh, was part of the process. Would this law maybe prevent uh, like judges who are not practicing family law uh, from from stepping in and filling into these uh, these uh, uh, hearings or is it is just strictly or is this strictly going to be just for uh, for family law judges to educate the judges so it's going to raise the level of education on domestic violence and coercive control for federally appointed judges that's a separate issue i think that uh, it would be optimal and phil could speak to this more so right that you would want a family law lawyer becoming a judge in the family court uh, system, um, but all the judges need to be need to be educated. So, uh, if that labor lawyer um, had received education and training on domestic violence, it it would have made considerable difference for my daughter Kira. Yeah, at, at the way that it's currently done, you don't necessarily always get a family law judge. It, it's a little bit of a different and sticky issue, uh, but I think that's one it's better addressed to senior regional justices who handle scheduling of, of matters and which judges are assigned where. Um, but th this law is meant to be for all judges uh, who are federally appointed. Uh, so whether you get that labor law lawyer who became a judge, criminal law judge or family law judge, hopefully they'll, they'll take this training and make different decisions. One of the things that I talked about with Jennifer when we first um, started working on this was that Canadian society in general needs to be educated on domestic violence and coercive control. So by by passing this bill, we've taken a small step, but Kira's law is now being talked about across the country. So not just by judges, uh, it's being talked about by so many groups across the country to get an understanding of what coercive control looks like and domestic violence and the, the impact that that has on women and children. So this is this is starting the movement. It's one, I think, uh, Yara, you said this yesterday about a rock being thrown and it creates a ripple effect and that's what's going to happen here. I mean, so Kira was failed by so many in the system and with the Ontario government and hopefully others moving to um, require education for Children's Aid Society, for police officers. Um, this is, is the start, not the end. And it's, it's creating conversations at dinner tables, at golf clubs, across the country to make sure that people are actually learning about coercive control and domestic violence. And they're mentioning Kira's name, which is absolutely incredible. Thank you. Can I thank the journalists too, who shared Kira's story across the country? Um, so many, so many journalists, and Jennifer has has spoken to so many people. I don't know how she finds the, the courage to tell the story over and over again. But, you know, journalists have have been key to sharing Kira's story and and to helping us um, ensure that her legacy is shared. And and uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us for for what you've done. Can I bug for a few more questions? Since I'm, um, <laughs> just, we'll, we'll get just uh, time, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah I just want to. So, just two more things. One, this law is now passed. So, what's next? Like, you you have this law. How do you make sure that this actually happens? That judges do get this education. That that these changes actually happen. What's well, in the law? <laughs> and you know what? I mean, there's been conversations. Um, even even when we passed Bill C three, which was around sexual assault, and and I think. You know, there's a separation between judges and um, legislators. 
But I think the message has been heard loud and clear, and I think there's a willingness to do it. And if we keep talking about Kira's law and we keep pushing, um, even judges who are resistant to training will have no choice but to hear about it and start questioning perhaps their decisions that when you know, a mom has a dead rat put in her mouth, that perhaps that guy's not a good father, right? So I think by having these conversations, um, but they are taking it seriously, and it is the law. That, that it be part of the training and uh, we'll we'll keep keep watching it, right? Can I just add to yeah. that? Yeah. So when we started on this journey of looking at course of control and the added value in judges training for it, we also looked at what was happening around the world. So you can look at countries like Australia, the UK, here in Canada in 2021, the Department of Justice did do a study on on course of control in terms of finding the definitions of how to grapple with this form of domestic violence, which has been part of the underbelly of households across this country and around the world for women for many, 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 many years. Uh, the pandemic heightened that fact. But the truth is that what we've done is we've put course of control training into the law now, which is is a huge step. It hasn't, a lot of places are studying it still. It hasn't gone to that transition phase, phase of becoming law. So I think in this case, and, and thanks to the team that we have and to, to Jennifer and Philip, um, Canada is leading that conversation now. Um, judges can't uh, judges are, uh, the, the training that judges do is reported to the, the Minister of Justice every year. We see what they're they're studying, what they're learning about. We've heard from many stakeholders across the country that they'd like to be involved in preparing this training so that their voices are front and center. We've also heard from social workers, uh, you know, legal aid uh, agencies that also want more training in this. So, you know, having it in the law, as, as Pam so well said, means that we can't shy away from this discussion any longer. Um, and it's bringing... When you want to come out of the darkness, you bring it into light. So we've brought that into light with with uh, Kira's law. And as I mentioned earlier, the toolbox. So what are the preventative tools that we have already available as this is being contemplated, which is why the electronic monitoring piece, it's, it's not perfect. We know that. We know for rural and remote communities, electronic monitoring will not be the ideal solution. But it's, it's a step in the right direction. We need to look at the actionable, preventable measures that be, can be taken for women and children who are fleeing domestic violence. And by having the training, coupling it with highlighting the tools that are available, we are starting to create the ripple effect of those layers of, of safety for, for those who need it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you. I don't think they're oh, they're oh, there. Oh, there. 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 There.